I still, I, you know, I haven't been in front of a classroom professionally for a long time, and I still feel powerful when I can stand and look around the room and everybody just gets quiet. And then I know it's all for naught. So you're here to see someone else tonight. So welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Shannon McNerney. Thank you so much for, for coming. I'm the director of Fish Trap, and I'm so excited to be able to offer a rare May program for us and a very special program. Wow. Featuring, this is, I've learned this from you and it just actually is uh, our spring writer in residence and uh, she's going to join us tonight sharing some of the work she's created while getting to spend time in her homeland and I want to thank her for honoring us. So thank you. I'll tell you about Sarah in a minute, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit uh, about the writer in residence program with Fish Trap. Um, Mike coined this phrase a few years ago and I love it that the last act of mastering your craft is giving it away. And that's what our writer and res residence program is. It's a little bit different than other residence programs that you'll see. And part of that is that it's a service-based program as well. So a fish trap writer in residence, it lasts anywhere from four to six weeks, um, usually during the months of April and May. And we do another one in the fall. Some of you may have remembered our, our, our fall writer, Liza. Um, and we pay a stipend, we cover travel and lodging. Before I forget that, we want to thank our friends at Kokanee Inn. They have put our writers and residents up for a total of 12 weeks this year, and they donate that time. So please thank them. I got to see uh, Eric and Missy today and actually was able to tell them again that they are making this program possible for us. So if you get a chance to see them in the community, please thank them. Uh, and they already have said they want to continue to do this, so they're wonderful people. Uh, they also, the, our lodge, our, what we want to do is provide a writer an experience to come and be here in the magical months of April where it's always beautiful and sunny and there's never any... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> to, experience, to experience Wallowa County, to get a chance to work on their, their writing, but also to really get to know the community, to get into the community, to get into the schools. So what will we ask them to do is to provide about eight hours a week of in-school instruction in our schools. So we reach out to each of the schools and say, hey, how would you feel about having what a professional writer in your classroom doing creative writing work. We, because of this, we have a high, high standard for who we accept into our writer and residence program. We want people who know how, not just how that are professional artists and writers, but people who know how to work with kids and are in a classroom. So this is a, a program that for the most part, for the last several years, we, we have an application process, but we've been personally picking and taking recommendations for folks. I can say this publicly, um, Sarah is here because of Beth Piotope. Um, I asked Beth this summer, I said, do you know someone who would, we would love to have a Nimipu writer here in the county? And she said, come here. So, <laughs> and Sarah, we've joked about it since then. We talked at Summer Fish Trap and she said, oh yeah, I think I'd like to do that someday. And I said, are you free this spring? So, uh, best decision we've made. So um, she also, we also ask people to teach a, a local writing workshop in the community. And Sarah, some of you, I think there are some of her students here taught a four week improv class. If you were in that class, could you raise your hand? So see, you gotta improv. Yes, and you will. So yeah, uh, and so thank you for that. Uh, so she was here doing that in, the, in this building. So since arriving last month, Sarah has spent over 35 hours count that, in our local schools, including Alted, Wallowa, Enterprise, and Joseph Charter, so she was throughout the county. She also led a four-week improv class, um, an after-school creative writing class. She, she jumped in there. Do you all know that Wallowa has an after-school volunteer creative writing group that meets? There, uh, there are about 10 of those kids that are in that right now. They do it on their own, and nine of them have scholarships to come to Summer Fish Trap this year. So. And there would have been more, but nine of them applied. So that's how that worked. <laughs> and she even tried her hand in an abstract painting class at the Giuseppe Center. And that work is behind the brownies in the kitchen. So she has, uh, she, while she was here too, this is crazy. I'm going to plug her a little bit. She, her work was featured at the Under the Elms Festival at, the, at Lewis and Clark State College. She went up over the weekend and did that while she was here. She also has been to Alaska and back during her time here and is unafraid. This is something I want y'all to note. She's unafraid to drive rattlesnake at night. That's all. Okay. 
she has absolutely been one of the most engaged and active visiting artists we've ever, ever encountered. And one that I hope and I'm planning on welcoming back again and again. She's, she's one of us. So Fish Traps Writers in Residence Program is sponsored in part by Kokanee Inn and also funding from the Oregon Arts Commission. So please uh, join me in acknowledging those folks. That's what pays for these programs. So thank you. And of course, everything you do, you know, dropping a little money in the fish, joining our fish trapper program all helps provide these kind of opportunities and makes it possible for us to provide these free to our students and to you. So about Sarah, Sarah is uh, an Imipu Nez Perce multidisciplinary artist. Boy, is that the truth. Her work highlights the symbiosis of storytelling and language reclamation and infuses her instruction with traditional and contemporary storytelling techniques. Her work has been published in literary journals such as the Yellow Medicine Review and Pork Belly Press. Her short play, Not My Grandmother's Coyote, I'm Not Even Gonna Try That, <laughs> was featured in, as I just said, the LCSE uh, uh, He Manifest in spring of 2021. She's also a member of the Nimipu Writers Collective, Luke Kipsime, whom many of you got to see at Summer Fish Trap this last year, as well as a member of the Chester County, Pennsylvania-based improv group, Better Than Bacon. And she is our friend, and I am so pleased to welcome Sarah Hennessy to the stage. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm already crying. <laughs> There's going to be lots of tears. Um, this is such a, such a beautiful opportunity, and it's it's very bittersweet for me because um, I came here knowing that this was part of, you know, my family's homeland, and I'm leaving calling this home, um, and I'm hoping to call it home in the future, perhaps. <laughs> um, just a truly transformative experience um, to be able to be here and to be in and of a creative space, um, in and of such a beautiful community. Um, and, you know, I'll take all the weather. I'll take the snow. I'll take the rain. I'll take the clouds on the mountains. You'll hear about that later. <laughs> um, so, thank you all um, for being here. Um, yeah, I'm just oh, um, feeling very raw, a little bit like my work. This is actually um, almost more nerve wracking to share this like new raw work um, than to share polished pieces. And so I am just, um, and actually I have to shout out the um, Enterprise High School creative writing seniors. They got to hear the original version of one of these poems. They were the first ever audience and they were such a gracious audience. Um, and so, yeah, my time in the classrooms has just been transformative and humbling and, you know, beyond any of my expectations when I arrived. Um, and so I'm going to start off with, um, with kind of a fun piece. Um, I'm currently wearing some cedar earrings I got as a gift from a friend of mine. And um, he is, he has fostered my love of Beyonce. <laughs> and so <laughs> Beyonce's last album has just been on repeat um, for a while. And so this is a piece, it's called Self Portrait as Beyonce Deep Cut. <laughs> And so if anybody knows the song Thick, then you might have, like feel a little bit of resonance with that, but here we go. Self-portrait as Beyonce deep cut. I'm that Nitska Nitska, that Tim Intitmina, ambitious Nimipu cultivating unity. I'm that hip sway, that sachet, all eyebrows and coordinates. I'm that master plan, that tall and tan, boots heavy and breath light. I'm that absolute trickster, not miss nor mister. I am my own and harbor secrets. I'm that limb flail, that hark and wail, eyes focused, smile at the ready. I'm that hollered prayer, that hardened stare, words enunciated and pristine. So. <laughs> Oh, Kitsiao. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I'm also so I'm also a fiber artist and a bead worker. So I actually want to just take a second and make sure everybody can see uh, my Godzilla. So I'm just gonna do a little spin. Everybody on this side. <laughs> um, 
this jacket is sort of a, um, just like me learning, you're right? I'm learning how to hand stitch. I'm learning how to do uh, more complicated beadwork. I'm learning how to wear my art with pride. Um, and so this is sort of my whole gesture of self-love and representing myself and where I come from. Um, and then this piece, so I also uh, knit and crochet. Let me get a tissue really quickly. <laughs> I knit and crochet, and um, I have some injuries <laughs> because of it, <laughs> some overuse injuries. Um, and so my, uh, Nael, my paternal grandmother, was also an avid crocheter. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get to know her as well as I would have liked. Um, and she passed back in 2011. Um, but so this is a piece that I wrote kind of as an ode to, uh, to fiber arts. <laughs> I extend a hand, self same way I was taught all along, and it is measured and calibrated and cataloged as a historic gesture. My hands have always been my own, haven't they? No, there's proof riddled through history. They're not mine, and I may not have rightful claim to them. If we trace this certain branch of the tree we can see that technically I might owe my hands to a generation of uncompensated ancestors. Harried, wearied, what is the word for an ancestral acknowledgement of exhaustion? I feel tendon thrum, self same way my ancestors did, overused hands twang with strain. Do we share these hands? Have I lifted with the same force and come crashing down again? with the same force as, say, my great-grandparents? What kind of force did they use? Which tendons twanged for them? In evening quiet, which bodily thrum burned even well after resting? Um. So one evening, I drove out. Um, <sighs> there's the historical marker, right, as if you go past Safeway, and there's that bend, and it's right at the entering Enterprise sign. I discovered that if you park there at sunset, oh, my goodness, you can just see the whole valley light up. And so it was a Wednesday after a long, like rainy, cloudy day. And right around, I would probably say six o'clock, the sun started to kind of pierce through the clouds. And so I went up there about sunset and I stood there just in awe of these orange clouds, the way they hung over the mountain. And they were thick enough that there was the ridge in the distance that you could barely see until the sun hit exactly the right spot. And then you could see the sawtooth of the pine trees. And I was like, oh, that's not a cloud. That's, that's the, the, the mountain. That's the, the ridge line. And then as I stood there, the sun kind of cleared out a little bit more of the clouds. And I could see a little more distinctly the hillside. And it just... <sighs> It really took my breath away, and it reminded me of a story um, that I'm actually going to read to you um, in order to give context to the next poem. And so the story, I, and I wanted to read it from this collection, the Nez Perce Coyote Tales, um, that I got at the book loft. <laughs> um, it's called Coyote and His Daughter, and I wanted to read it to make sure I captured the details correctly, um, because I knew getting up here I would be very overcome with emotion, so I'm, I'm going to read this story to you. Coyote and his daughter. Now I'm going to tell a story. Coyote was living with his daughter. A river flowed nearby, and on its bank, the poor ones had their teepee. Coyote was sickly. He wasn't strong, and his daughter took care of him. He had a good daughter, a nice girl, and she took care of her father. Coyote was always hungry for something, saying, go look for wolf leavings or meat upriver. Go and get some of that and then make broth with it. Oh, excuse me. 
Then his daughter would go and gather all of the wolf leavings, such as bones with some meat on them, that were scattered here and there. And she would bring them home and make broth for Coyote. He would say, thank you, my child. I ate well and I feel good. He was ailing and weak. Every day she would go up river and bring home meat leavings for her father. One day, Coyote's daughter went down to the river. She saw five big steelhead salmon lying in a pile by the hole in the ice where she usually got water. A young man appeared, and he told her, These are yours. Take the steelheads. We want to take you for a wife. What do you think? We'll take you to our good home under this river. There you'll live peacefully. The maiden told him, First, I'll ask my father for his views. For that reason, I cannot say yes right now. We'll see what my father says, and then in a few days, I'll let you know. The young man answered, yes, you shall come and answer us. Their proposal was to take her and marry her. She had decided to take one steelhead to her father, but he said to her, that's bad. No, I don't want any steelhead. No, no, I only want good deer meat. She took the steelhead away and kept it for herself. In a few days, the girl went down again to get water. There was Otter, that handsome-looking youth. How did it turn out, he said. But earlier, she had told her father that they had proposed to her, and he had said, no, you aren't going to marry them, no. So she said to him, my father said I couldn't marry you. Then Otter gave up and went back under the ice. The girl went home. Later, she went upstream, and she looked for meat. She found some bones with a little meat on them that the wolves had left after eating, and she took them home. Oh, this is good, Coyote said. This makes me feel good and strong. One day she went out again and she found a whole deer on the ground. Five wolf brothers came upon her. They proposed marriage and she told them, I'll tell my father. There's no way I can answer you now. It is up to him to answer and he'll decide. They took the whole deer home for her. She dried it and cooked the deer meat for her father. She said, father, the wolf brothers proposed to me. They want to take me. He said, yes, that's good. You can marry them because even though you go, you can still take care of me. They always have plenty of good meat. I like that kind. Being coyote, I want meat, not fish. A few days later, she went looking for meat. And she went up river to meet the wolf brothers. When she came upon them, they asked, what's the answer? She said to them, my father says it's all right for me to marry you. They said, tomorrow we will come get you. Then she went home and got ready and she told her father, tomorrow they will come for me. And Coyote answered, all right, you can still come and see me now and then. So the next day, the wolves came, and they took her far away into the mountains. They went up and on. They went one more day. Oh, what a good teepee was standing there. There was a big, pretty teepee, lots of dried meat, and plenty of food. After she had arrived, she and the five brothers set up house there. And now the otters were angry. They missed the girl because she didn't come for water anymore. They thought, that settles it. They suspected the wolves. They plotted. We'll go one morning and make trouble. Then all five of them went up and saw the trail and followed the tracks. And there, from a distance, they saw the teepee. They stopped, thinking, we'll stay here. We won't go any closer, for they'll see us. We'll hide. There they stayed until it was quite dark. They heard the wolves laughing and telling stories inside the teepee, and the girl was also laughing. Finally, it was quiet, and then they heard snoring. All inside were asleep. The Otter brothers advanced. They had small sticks and pitch and dry pieces of wood, and they put lots of logs close along the edge of the teepee. Inside, the wolves and the girl were sleeping, just snoring away. Then the otters put dry wood near the teepee and set fire to it. They had sticks ready, and when the wolves and the girl tried to get out, the otters pushed them back in. And all of them burned there, the five brothers and the wife. Then the otters went back, quite satisfied, recalling, we had the good fortune to destroy all of them. Several days passed, but Coyote still had lots of meat, so he didn't know what had happened. Then one day, he heard up high, Father, now we are on a journey. What? Coyote said, looking up. Then again, he heard, now we are going. We are going to live no more on this earth. Now we are spirits. Coyote answered, no, what can I do here in this world, my girl? And his daughter said, build a big fire and jump in. Eventually, you too will be just like us, and you'll be able to travel with us. 
If your body is just like it is, it will be impossible to come with us where we are going. So Coyote made a fire, and he jumped into it. Ouch! And he jumped right out again. Then he tried it again and again. Finally, he gave up, and his daughter said, You can go the way you are. You can sense us traveling along. You will hear us high up. For several days, they traveled, and they went over five mountains. Over that way, they went. This must be the place, Coyote thought. It is the spirit's land. That is the way poor Coyote went. He went over five mountains. When they arrived, it was twilight. There was not a soul around. It became dark, and a multitude of people arrived. All kinds of men, all dressed up, were gambling in one place. And in another, they were dancing, and in yet another, they were racing. Everyone was doing something. Coyote was fascinated, and his eyes were rolling. Oh, this is so wonderful, he said. He stood watching. Then he saw his daughter and the spirits. They looked just like humans in the dark. Soon it became lighter, and the sun rose. Gone. They were suddenly gone. Coyote was alone there all day long. This went on for a month and more. He became relentless or restless and lonesome. In the daytime, he was all alone, and at night, he wasn't interested in the activities. One night, he said to his daughter, Now, my child, I am lonesome. I don't want to be here anymore. I wish I could go home. She said, Get some buckskin somewhere or make something and wrap us and carry us on your back. Go back up the same way you came, but don't look back this way. Don't look back. Coyote agreed, and he got some buckskin ready. He bundled them up and packed them on his back. He went up the hill. Oh, this is nothing, he thought. They are light, not heavy. He walked fast, and now and then he rested. He ate whatever he had. When it got dark, he slept. On he went, but the load began to get heavy. Now he barely could get over the top, and he rested often. Then it rained, and the trail became slippery. Poor Coyote wasn't making any headway. There was just one more hill to go over. As he was going, he slipped, and he looked behind him. The pack disappeared, and he heard them. Now we are leaving you forever. His daughter laughed as she went. They were gone forever. He never saw them again. The poor thing finished his climb, and there he sat. Then he cried out loud, my daughter, my daughter, my child, my child. His tears ran down. Then he became quiet and said, all right, I'm not the only one who will overcome sorrow. In a short time, human beings will come. These days will be no more. Through the generations, they will be sorrowful, just as I am sorrowful. They will lose their last child and feel the pain of sorrow. I am not alone in having this sorrow. Through the generations, this sorrow will come to them. Then he wiped his te tears and went home, looking for his friend Fox. And he came to him. There the two friends lived forever. That's all. So this poem I wrote, referencing what I saw, um, I wrote it dedicated to a, a friend who I considered a younger sister um, who was taken from us too soon. Um, and it's untitled as of yet. Orange Light. Though some may say you're swathed in it, I know it radiates from you. Important distinction. It's you there on the ridge, you nearly imperceptible among the bold peaks of pines, nearly imperceptible save the radiance, of course. I know it's you without knowing. I know the ridge for all its bold peaks and presence is not land I can traverse with you, not yet. What I know is I must count by fives and wait without seeing. See, already proof I'm right. And then by fives, I'll see you. Coyote told me once, perched upon a bridge over the Columbia, so you really know it's true. So I know it's you without knowing, and I know that land, that Aitzimwaspa, isn't for me, not yet. The knowledge alone is enough for me, also alone. 
yet Watu Mawa Imzi Wat Kwas. It occurs to me as a sunbeam orange bathes my page. Could see out y'all, thank you. I sit on the lengthened shores of the lake, literal pooled memory waiting winter's release to wash my memory anew, not away, not even clean, rather wash my memory free of minute clutter to expand into vastness to greet your orange radiance right. I just want to thank everybody for holding such beautiful space for me. Um, yeah, that was the poem that I shared with the uh, creative writing seniors for the first time. And like I said, they were an exceptionally gracious audience. Um, um, this next piece is just kind of a, a quiet meditation on nature. <laughs> um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and all the waterways in that area are all, they're just brown. You know, they're just silty, muddy, and so that's kind of just how I conceive of nature. And it's still beautiful, but then being here, and especially going to the lake the first time a couple years ago, I was like, wow, what? I thought it was like only the, oh, let's see how, yeah. um, you know, I thought it was only like the tropics that <laughs> there was water that blue. So, you know, I'm glad to be uh, learning better, but here's just a small piece. Um, silt and mud, expected waterway congestion, yet I've only ever known silted, muddy waters. Beautiful, don't let me sound as though I'm complaining, beauty being a vast and fragmented thing. And now I stand astonished on a pebbled bank, and I stand staggering, not for lack of balance, rather lack of belief. How could that sun rays kiss blush the waters blue? Under cloud cover, a sly labradorite hinting, glinting blue. And in sun, revealed to be a blue flash opal, a shade of cayenne our own sky aspires to. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, oh, and here's the cloud-covered mountains. <laughs> um, yeah, more meditations on nature. Uh, who could begrudge cloud cover swaddling mountains? Who among us hasn't tossed about in bed on a cool spring morning, drawing the cover ever closer, instinctual scrunching of toes, easy, shallow breath unfurling, simple unknitting of muscles? Who could dare see a mountain and command it bear itself? When we have all stared, ever longing to the sky, cataloging stories we told ourselves about what clouds are made of, anecdotes offered, others offered, as we gaze, dazed. Cloud drape, beyond a boa, beyond the finest jewels, these mountains are adorned with the season's latest hit. Cloud formations that mask mountains, fog and mist accent, roiling cumulus flexed like a bicep. I am weak with wonder, an appetite only soil and rain will sate. I am dream filled and I am in love. I am love as I stare at cloud cover swaddling mountains. Um, so I'm a little bit of a sucker for love poems. <laughs> uh, so I have a couple pieces that I've just been kind of playing with. Um, so here's the first. The sun taught me. Thusly, I part the clouds of my brow and shine. Is your smile the sun and I the moon? Or maybe celestial metaphors are trite. Perhaps my heart only started beating to your rhythm I won't burden you with liability. And besides, maybe music metaphors are trite as well. We shine, bright, boisterous. Our shine needs no explanation. 
we can keep our metaphors and secrets. Um, and this is another just like small sort of love poem. I would lay lips upon your arm. Know you would smile when you feel my when you feel me smile. Know you would chuckle in the small way you do when your fingers trace my jawline. And you know I'll fold into myself, first in and away, and then into you. When your fingers find the nape of my neck, you know my breath will catch. And I know you'll be smiling, though your cheeks will soften, because I know you'll be seeing through me and into lifetimes, our hands, our breath, our hunger matched. And you know I will sharpen in the moment before a kiss, because you know I make no jest of kisses. And you know I mean to be deliberate, because you know I do not love lightly. And I know the safe harbor of your arms, know it in my sleep, know it in my bones, know it in the ways our love has revived through lifetimes, awakens in us anew after we've parted. Um, so I did, I came here from Lewiston and I actually went back for, um, the, uh, the play fest where I directed, um, a short play that I wrote and right in early March at LCSC, there was an art exhibit that ended up with some censored artwork. Um, and because I was next in line to go and present art at this institution, um, I was, well, just as an artist in general, I was a little rattled. And then being next in line to go and work with this institution, I was anxious. I was anxious that perhaps I might end up in the same position. Um, and so that's been just vibrating in me all along. And I did my project. It was beautiful. I had a beautiful cast and crew. Um, there were no problems. There was never even a threat of a problem for my personal project. Um, I don't feel that there was resolution for the other artists, but that's its own, its own other issue. Um, but this poem specifically was in reference to, to these events that unfolded. Might as well be tape on the mouth. In earnest, it might as well be on the mouth and wrists and tacking down hair. One swift yank rips skin and hair all the same. It might as well be. So they didn't knock down my door, didn't rummage through precious things, handmade blanket, inherited books, the drape of bracelets and twinkle of earrings. But they rummaged through our mouths, extracting words, maybe just one. No. Let's not give them grace. Rummage is not the word. It was pillaged. We all know about pillagers. So it's taken unceremoniously. I have to wonder if anyone would remember the ceremony for removal, for farewell. The thing is, I don't. Maybe it's in the blood somewhere, mapped like constellations, a guide, quiet, and waiting for consult. So I harbor these words, tuck them in the crook of my arm, or rather, hold them in the curve of the tongue. When might they come for it? Might as well tape the word. Might as well. Um, and just to return to a little bit of upbeat <laughs> poetry. <laughs> Um, I have this very short piece, and um, if anybody wants to inform me of what I'm talking about after the fact, I am open to it. <laughs> so, untitled, but I haven't seen a Bigfoot yet. Am I not supposed to say that? I'm uncertain about the nature of Bigfoot superstition. I haven't seen one, though I watched the thin tracts of trees, hoping for a lurch, a stagger, a lumber, no pun intended. I wait with childlike wiggles because I want to see that more than human stride, yet I am uncertain. Um, and this is uh, the final poem. And um, again, it's fairly lighthearted. Um, 
and it's just titled, I don't judge you for snow tires late in the season. <laughs> I, too, am a procrastinator. I would never judge. I, too, wonder, well, what if? And we've all hit that one season where we got overambitious, only for our hard work to double back and around for that. One damn storm and that one damn afternoon when on any other year we'd be riding comfortably snow-tired. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, um, so I actually, the, the play that I wrote and directed, um, just back last month was, uh, entitled The Change of Venues, um, and that was sort of an abstract piece, and it was kind of a love letter to myself, which turned into kind of a love letter to anyone who's ever dealt with anxiety, um, and then the, the, first short play, uh, which Shannon referenced, called Not My Gro Grandmother's Coyote, um, that I directed back in 2021, and it's actually, so it was a short play that featured myself and another actor, um, but it's actually going to be a larger piece, um, and so I've been revising it as I've been here, and this is essentially turning into a one-person show, um, and so I would like to debut... <laughs> the this portion of that one person show um here with all you kind folks um so it's entitled watu nakatsam itsiaya not my grandmother's coyote titokatikta et kamawa titokatikta witsasa tots titokan witsasih titots titokan nunam titluma himtsisik kahi loitse Good evening, friends, and all my relations. Tots at papine, it's good you came. Wakaswi, or excuse me. Inwas nimipu ka inwas titokan. I am Nez Purse and I am a person. Wakaswisa, I am alive. Wakaswi you, I will survive. Titoka tikta et kamoa titoka tikta witsasa tots titokan witsasih titots titokan nunum titluma himtsisih kahiloitsih ki titwa tatiwis titskits ka ikuin. This story is wonderful and true. Timnapa in the heart. Timnapa huuyasik timnapa. They start in the heart. My love and my voice, and aren't they the same thing? Don't they echo familial whispers? Timnapa, in the heart. Timnapa, I am pre-colonial. I am the breath you took before you asked creator for a name. Timnapa, in the heart. Timnapa, inwas timnapa, or er, timina. I am the heart. Where the blood started, pumped from mother to child, child to mother. Timnapa, in the heart. Timnapa, wakeswisa, I am alive. I will survive. Isi at kwisih in Lautiwama. Who are you, my friends? Henaka isi at kwisih in Lautiwama. Again, who are you, my friends? Consider itsiyaya, coyote. Itsiyaya, coyote, sometimes feels feathers in place of fur on his shoulders swears he feels a weight long but light lay across his body, his tail. It's Yaya Coyote wakes from the flutter of falling, certain his wings dropped him. Tilipa Fox tells It's Yaya Coyote there's nothing on his back. No bear spots? No. No feathers? No, just fur. Itsiyaya never knows when his wings will come to him, nor when they'll leave again. He considers flight a gift, but its sudden retreat a test of patience and resolve. The dulcet tones of Kotz Kotz, meadowlark, call to mind whispers of ancestors. Itsiyaya cries to think he flies only when he dreams of dying. Pukakia wasikyutsna'a. We are sometimes pitiful, no? 
Itsiaya wadu him stukwitsa, ka atk mistukwitsa ki tsipen wataa. Coyote doesn't understand, and you don't understand my words, is that right? Titoka tsikta, et ka moa titoka tsikta, witsasa tots titokan, witsasik titots titokan, nunum titluma him tsisik ka hiloetsik. I speak the people's language. Because when I speak the people's language, I become a better person. We become better people. Our ancestors hear, and they are happy. What mistukwitzik? What do? Do you all understand? No. In Lautiwama is si at huisik. My friends, who are you? Again, consider itziyaya. Its yayo was sleeping when the wildfire started, so he couldn't be sure if he'd started it. Had the fur on his paws and tail always been tinged with black? Its yaya cupped water and marched to the nearest embers, only when he got there, he was so thirsty, he lapped up the water, tasted the soot ground into his fur. Oh my gosh, just pitiful. Isn't that right? What do? Now, do you understand? No? Hanukkah, again. Oikolo is si at kwasik. Everyone, who are you? What awas it's yaya? Are you coyote? It's Iyaya can't conjure confidence enough to know his own reflection. When he looks, it gives him tilipetnim matsayo, fox ears, or himinim pitnesis, wolf snout, ipsus, hands, where paw pads were. His rump feels bare, but his tail taps his leg light but fast. It's Iyaya in the night forgets the color of his fur, and upon waking, bites his tail, sure it is a stranger. He yelps, bears his teeth. The stranger is hostile. He bites again. It's a yeah, yeah, watches his feet as he walks, not sure they will stay on this earth, not sure he will recognize them as they march on stars, singeing and dancing through asteroid belts to reach the far flung heaven his ancestors hide in. Weetsa, weetsa, et ka itsiyaya, wa tu his lutsukwitsa ipnim tsilokt, wa tu hitsukwitsa ipnim tipmina. I cry, I cry because Coyote doesn't know his body, doesn't know his tipmina heart. Timpnapa, in the heart, Timpnapa, it started in the heart's first electric pulse, Timpnapa, in the heart, Timpnapa, wakiswisa, ka wakiswiyu. I am alive and I will survive. Timpnapa in the heart. Timpnapa mana wat nikissa. What is your name? Kumwea, come here. Wixatlich, sit down. Ahatawasa kunku, wach kunku. I love you always and always. Because I am born of the occupation, I am the reason they said aim low in the teepees. I live despite the bullet burrowed in a chest wall. Isn't that why it hurts so much to look me in the eyes? Isn't that why their tongues can't slide through words, can't find their place in the cannon barrel of their mouths? Timp Napa in the heart, Timp Napa, that first place they felt it, Timp Napa in the heart. I am not their torment, not their atonement. Their sins were birthed from their bodies and into the world, screaming, Mana wat nikissa, what is my name? Kumwea, come here. Wixitlich, sit down. Ahatuasa, kunku, wach kunku. I love you always and always. Mitzio homt, listen. Hanaka itsiyaya hitolaitsa. Again, coyote goes up river. Metu ki he was watu nakatsa mitsiyaya. But this is not my grandmother's coyote. 
Kihi was nunum itziaya. This is our coyote. Isi at kwasik in Lautiwama. Who are you, my friends? Hanukkah is si at kwasik. Again, who are you? Wat awas itziaya? Are you coyote? Itziaya swears as he swims that his toes grow webs, that his belly becomes ensconced in scales. Itziaya can almost feel his neck open, gills gaping and fluttering. Though not frightened of the water, Itziaya loathes the cloying cold. He always imagines it will numb his limbs and having frozen, he'll join the journey upstream, Natsuochnin, with the salmon and he'll spawn a new generation. When Itziaya reaches instinctively towards the shore, he's shocked by the leanness of his arm, the fur soaked and still matted like scales. Itziaya knows he feels webbing in his toes even as he ambulates over the ridge, away from the riverbank. Itziaya can't catch his breath as he climbs the crest overlooking the river valley. He can only writhe in the dirt. He can only gaze with gaping eyes, gasp as Waptus, eagle, collects him. Itziaya cannot account for the way his mouth wavers in silent oaths. Is it fear or loss of breath? Waking to a song, Itziaya could swear it was his own voice. He finds himself perched upon the back of Waptus eagle, wings wide. Wat mistukwitze? Do you all understand? In was itziyaya. Kaim a was itziyaya. Kaim, 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 kaim. I am coyote, and you are coyote, and you, and you, and you, and you. Nun wasik itziyaya, we are coyote. Titokatsikta et kamawa titokatsikta, witsasa tots titokan, witsasik titots titokan. Nunum titluma himtsisik kahiloitsik. I speak the people's language because when I speak the people's language, I become a better person. We become better people. Our ancestors hear and they are happy. I am the aftermath. I am born of blood and earth, joy and sunrise. I am alive and I will survive. Timnapa in the heart. Timnapa where it started, the love that brought me to life. Timnapa in the heart. Timnapa where Inam Watnit. My name was born. The song sang to me to keep me strong. Timnapa in the heart. Timnapa kumwea. Come here. Wixitli. Sit down. Titokatsikta. I speak the people's language. Et kamoa titokatsikta witsasa tats titokem. Because when I speak the people's language, I become a better person. Because we become better people. What, Mistukwisik? Do you understand? In was nimipu. I am Nez Purse. Kanun wisik titokan. And we are all the people. What, Mistukwisik? Do you understand? Kumwea. Come here. Wixitli. Sit down. Ahatawasa kunku wach kunku. I love you always and always. Ki titwata tiwaka titskitska ikuin. Tikta timnapkitnik kunku wach kunku. This story was wonderful and true. I speak from the heart always and always. Wako quick. Now go. Metu et nipnesik. But remember, we are alive, and we will survive. Timnapa, in the heart. Timnapa.
Hannah Krakratzia, yeah, again, thank you. Um, it has been such a genuine privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, 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 hello. Thank you, that's all. <laughs> Oh, well, so uh, before you run off, do know if we have some refreshments and things in the kitchen, please take time to, to go greet this wonderful human being before she goes back to the other coast and welcome her, encourage her to come back home again. Um, a couple of things I wanted to tell you before I send you off into the night. Um, we do have one more writing workshop for this year's series that is being offered by an EOU MFA student. We do a partnership with, with the Eastern Oregon University the MFA, and there is a workshop. Who's telling the story anyway? Any of you who are writing um, stories with first-person narratives, she's going to help you through that. So that's an online workshop. Go on to the website and check that out. It's a, it's a pay what you can, so $30. You can take a workshop for several weeks. Check it out. Also, on Friday, June 17th, right here, our last unofficial fireside of the season at 530 is with that Willow High School creative writing group. They're going to be here at 530. I would so encourage you to come in and, and share some love with them. And then we got this little other thing we do in July. Um, you may have heard of it, um, Summer Fish Trap. There's going to be a whole bunch of information we're going to send out, but I wanted to tease a couple of things. Um, we're going to open it off, um, opening day kickoff. All of the evening events are open to the public, as some of you know, hopefully most of you know. It's going to start off with our good friend and co-founder, Kim Stafford, kicking us off on that Monday night. We have quite the list of faculty. Jamie Ford will be our keynote, and we're going to close the whole thing off on Saturday night. You ready for this? With Louisa Rea and Kate Power and Steve Einhorn and Beth Wood with a concert and reading. Check out the website. We will have all this information up front. All of the events except Friday are free. Saturday is a fundraiser. I'm going to warn you for that right now, but come in and support these programs. We love you all. Thank you for coming. We will see you soon. Go give this lady some special attention. Thank you. Thank you.